So in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the, in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Amen. And please also turn to a second portion of Scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And let me also read this portion of Scripture for you. And here the Bible says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye may do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Amen. We thank the Lord for the reading of his holy word. Now this theme of walking in the old paths, it's a very important theme. But it's also not something that many would, in their first natural instinct, take well to it. Because naturally, we don't like that which is old. And that's why we would often use different descriptions to describe that which is old. It may be something that's outdated. It's something that is old-fashioned. We don't really like that which is old. We like something that is new. We like the novelty of new things. And that's why whenever there's something new that we receive or that's given to us, there's that thrill and that, that's that excitement of it. We like the sight of it. We like the smell of it. We often like that and prefer that which is new. But here, there is a warning given to us to not forsake that which is old but to continue walking in that which is old. And why was this instruction given to the children of Israel? Now, more specifically over here, the instructions were actually given to the children of Judah, the southern kingdom Judah, because at this time, the northern kingdom was already most likely occupied or destroyed by the Assyrians. And the warning here was given to the southern kingdom Judah. This was during the time of the divided kingdom, and the warning here was the warning of captivity. That the Lord has already given them a lot of time. Where now they are in their fullness of idolatry, they are in their fullness of their wickedness, and the Lord says that captivity is going to come. And that's what the book of Jeremiah was about. The book of Jeremiah was given to prophesy the fall of Jerusalem. So this book actually, in fact, has two parts to it. The first part would be the prophecies concerning the fall of Jerusalem. And then the second part from chapters 40 onwards would describe God's word given to his people after the fall. That means they already have experienced the fall of Jerusalem. And after that, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed now to react? How are they supposed to respond even to this fall that they have experienced. So this is what the book of Jeremiah is about. And when we come to Jeremiah chapter 6, right, which is the text for our theme, this was given in the midst of God's warning for Judah, where the Lord will explain to them why they must go into captivity. But the very sad thing and worrying thing is that despite this warning being given, this warning went unheeded. Right? And that's why if you actually read on in Jeremiah chapter 6, if you go on down to verse 17 onwards, you would see how the Lord actually said that the people responded by saying, we will not hearken. Right? In fact, at the end of verse 16 also, that was what the people said. We will not walk therein. So the Lord actually gave them the command, walk in the old paths. But the people said, we will not walk therein. 
So even as we consider this theme, we must realize that from the perspective of the children of Judah, they did not hearken to the warnings, to the command that God has given to them. Now for us, as we take this theme for our camp, to walk in the old paths, by the grace of God and by the mercies of God, we are not, yet, not in that same state as Judah. Because the, Jude, the children of Judah has already decided, they have already chosen, they will not walk in it. But now for you, you still have that choice. And of course, you must make the right choice. Choose to walk in the path. Choose to obey. Don't be stubborn. Don't be like the children of Judah where they responded and they said, we will not walk therein. We will not hearken. But that was the condition of the children of Judah in the days of Jeremiah. So when this prophecy was given to the children of Judah in the days of Jeremiah, the people have already made up their minds. The people have already chosen not to take it of this warning. But for us today, we still have that choice. And this is where we want to start this morning. We want to start first by understanding what is this old paths? What was this old paths that was given to, that were given to Judah? That the children of Judah understood. You'll notice that the Lord did not have to really explain or to spell out to them what these old paths were. Because the assumption, and it's a fair assumption, was that the people already understood, the people knew what these old paths were. It's about whether they would stand in it, whether they would obey and walk in these old paths. But it's important for us to define, right? To make sure we understand what are these old paths that the Lord wants us to walk in. It's not a mystery to them. It's not something that they have to find out as if they do not know. But would they choose to walk in it? Now, so for us, this is where we are going to begin this morning. Recognizing the old paths. What are these old paths that the Lord wants us to walk in? And there are three things that we can see, right? Based on this passage itself in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. And later, I will also refer us to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 3 to help us to understand these old paths. So the first thing that you can see with regard to these old paths that we need to recognize, that we need to define, is the Bible tells us that these paths are old. Means obvious, right? That's what the theme itself is about, the old paths. These are not the new paths, but these are old paths. But what is the meaning of this word old? Now, the word old here does not mean something that is outdated. Okay? As if it's own, old and worn out. As if it's old and irrelevant. As if it's old and no longer useful. Now, it's important to understand the meaning of the word old over here. Now, this word old, in fact, comes from the word which means something that is lasting something that is forever. It describes something that is perpetual, something that has been continuing on since ancient times. And so these old paths here are the paths that is already understood, that has been established from ancient times, from the past. It has always been there and it has lasted, it has remained it has stood firm. These old paths are the paths that their fathers walked in. These old paths are the paths that generations of faithful saints have walked in. And so these are the old paths that are always relevant, that are always useful, that is always needful for the people. And so this is the question. What then do these old paths refer to? Now, it cannot refer to certain new way or forms of worship that the children of Israel and the children of Judah has 
invented. Now we know that in the days of the divided kingdom, there were new inventions that they created. For example, when you go back to Jeroboam the first, right, during the divided kingdom after the death of Solomon, when Rehoboam took over the throne in the south, Jeroboam the first took over the north, right, in the divided kingdom. And one thing that the Bible tells us that what Jeroboam did was to erect two golden calves, one in the north and one in the south. That is in Dan and the other in Bethel. And the reason why he did that was because he did not want the children of Israel to return to Jerusalem to worship. And so he created these two places of worship that the people, instead of going down to Jerusalem, would remain in these places to worship. And we know that these two golden calves are idolatry. But do you know what they did? Just as what Aaron also did in the book of Exodus. They would attribute to these golden calves the name of Jehovah. And that was one of the problems in the time of Israel, where they, they had a kind of religion which is known as a syncretistic religion, a syncretistic worship. A syncretistic religion or a syncretistic worship is where they still maintain some form of the worship of the one living and true God, but yet at the same time, they also incorporate the idolatry of the heathen, the worship of the heathen. They would incorporate these things, but they would still use the name of God. They would still use the name of Jehovah, and they would put these two together. They would mix these two together, and then this would create a new, perhaps from their perspective, a more interesting way of worship. And that's what Jeroboam did. He maintained some of the forms of worship of Jehovah. He still maintained a semblance of the priesthood, but he changed some of the dates of the worship of Jehovah. So he would keep some things, but he would change some things. This is one example of something that is now new to them. A new form, and that is not the only example. You know, one reason why when we refer to the false gods of the Canaanites, why the Bible often describes the false gods as Baalim, is because they have actually different forms of the worship of Baal. There are many different types of Baals that they would worship. And these things are the new things that they have invented that maybe they are interested in. And that's why the Bible has to say, don't look at all these new things anymore. Return back to the old paths. And what are these old paths? The old paths are the covenants of God. The old paths are the words of God. And that is why we have actually, I have chosen, you know, for us to also look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Because what are the old paths? The old paths are the laws, the statutes, the commandments that God has given to the children of Israel. All the way, even in the time of Abraham, and then later on in the time of Moses, these are the laws and the commandments that the children of Israel understood based on God's covenant promises, based on His covenant relationship. Now, of course, you know, if you go back to the time of Abraham, they may not have the the Ten Commandments spelled out for them. They would not have the ceremonial law. They would not have the Levitical laws given to them yet. That's in the time of Abraham and even in the time of Adam. But that does not mean that they did not have the statutes of God. They did not have the judgments of God. And that's why we know that, for example, for Cain and Abel, they knew how they ought to worship God. Right? The Lord has already revealed to them His truth. And this is what we would call progressive revelation. Right? Where in the Old Testament, God would reveal His will. He would reveal His word, His truth progressively. Until the completion of the scripture. But what is, what is this old paths? These old paths are not their own inventions. They are not supposed, Abraham, He's not supposed to try to borrow the culture, the inventions of his time, right? In terms of the worship of God, in terms of what is 
in knowing God, in, in understanding how to relate to God. He's not supposed to worship in the way the Canaanites would worship. He's supposed to worship in what God has revealed to him. So as God revealed more and more, they would now have a more complete and a fuller way of knowing how they ought to worship God. And of course, in the time of Moses, with the ceremonial law, with the civil law, with the Ten Commandments, they would then have a more fuller way, fuller understanding right, of how they are to worship God compared to Abraham and compared to of course, to Adam. But that doesn't mean that Adam did not understand, right? And that was why Adam would have taught Cain and Abel what was the right way to worship God. And Abel worshipped God in the way that the Lord was pleased with, but Cain chose to worship in his own way. And that was why he was judged. But then what are the old paths? The old paths are the revealed will of God. And the revealed will of God is given in the words of God. And this is why in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible tells us that these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. That means the, from the very moment they possess the land, the law of God must never depart from them. Right? In fact, even before they possessed the land, while they were still wandering the wilderness, they are ready to keep the word of God. But especially so, after they enter the land, they must not allow the word of God to leave them. Right? They must still teach the word of God. They must still follow the word of God. And then the Bible says that these commandments are to be passed on from their son to their son's sons and to generations beyond. And so what are these old paths? These old paths are the words of God, what God has revealed, what God has given. And the idea of the word old tells us that it's always relevant because the word old here means something that's lasting, something that is perpetual. It is always relevant. And this is the first thing that we can think about as we think of the old paths, that is the word of God, the revealed will of God, the truth of God, the covenant promises of God, all given to us in his word. The first thing that we can see is that it is the old paths because it's always relevant. And this is one thing that we must always remember about the word of God, the old paths, is that as it, is, it was relevant, for Paul. It was relevant for Moses, for Abraham. It was relevant in the days of Jeremiah. So it is also still relevant and useful and important for us today. And that's the worrying thing. There are some people who have now this kind, this sense that we must keep up to date with the times in terms of even how they are to understand God in terms of how we are to relate to God, in terms of how we are to worship God, as if the old paths, the old way of worship that's prescribed for us in God's Word is no longer relevant for the 21st century. Now, of course, there are certain things that we have in the 21st century that we can use. For example, we can use technology. It does not mean that when we worship, we cannot use the air condition in the 21st century, we can use these things. But when we talk about the principles of worship in, in terms of what is relevant, that is where the danger lies. Where some people now feel as if they need something new, they need something fresh, they need something that's different, that is suited for the 21st century in terms of how they are to worship God. And one way that that is seen most clearly is in the music. How does God want us to worship Him in terms of the music? What, is, what are the principles? Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot, again, as mentioned, you know, there are certain technology, certain things that has been invented, but we are talking about the principles of worship. The person of God has not changed. The holiness of God has not changed. The solemnity that is required 
that worship must be in a way which would this, that would properly express the fear of God, that holiness of God. These things must not change. But in the 21st century, now when people think of worship, they want a kind of worship that is more casual, that is free. Because times have changed. And that's where the Bible tells us we need to return to the old paths because the old paths are always relevant. The Word of God is always relevant. And music or worship is just one aspect of our relationship with God. The Word of God is relevant, always relevant in how we ought to live our lives. Right? In terms of how we are to view the world. The Word of God is always up to date and we must choose to walk in it one way again another example of how people search for that which is new is where you can see all the new philosophies right the new ideas about how they ought to view god's word how they ought to view god and people tr keep trying to invent something new and that's where we have all these new isms and oftentimes these new isms, there are so many issues with them because they try to invent something new, but really they are a departure from the old paths that God has given to us. And this is where we must first understand that the old paths that is given to us in the Word of God, it is always relevant. It is never outdated. And it's always lasting. It is always there. It is not hidden. See, the idea of the word old also tells us this. That as is the old paths means that it has always been there. It's not as if these paths were taken away or hidden. And then now the people no longer knew the old paths and that they did not have it. And then because they did not have it, they are unable to walk in the old paths. They have the old paths. Now, if, if the old paths were in any way hidden, it's not because God hid it from them. It was because the people rejected it. It's, the pe it's because the people despised it, refused to walk in these old paths. And they no longer knew what these old paths were. And that was why even in history, there were occasions where they need certain revival or re reformation in the children in the lives of the children of Israel and in the lives of the children of Judah. But it was not because the old paths were not given to them. But it was because the people themselves ignored it. The people despised it. They refused to walk in it. But the old paths have always been given. Similarly, in the 21st century, the word of God, the old paths, we still have it with us today. But just because God has given it to us and we have it does not mean that everyone is walking in obedience to it. That everyone has the word of God and the will of God in their lives. That they are applying it, that they are obeying it, that they are walking according to it. But it's also important to remember that just because a person does not walk in the old paths, in the word of God, in the will of God, does not mean that the word of God, the will of God is not given. That the word of God and the will of God has been hidden. It is not hidden. It has been given. But will you walk in it? The old paths. God has revealed it to us. God has given it to us. We know what is this path that we have to walk. It is not outdated. It is always relevant. And that is the first thing that we must realize and understand with regard to these old paths that we need to walk in. Because this is going to be the foundation of our authority. And that's the second thing that we can look at with regard to the old paths. Now, if you come back to our text in Jeremiah chapter 6, You'll notice here that the Bible says, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Now, we are going to talk about the standing in the way, the seeing and the asking okay, in a moment, right? in the next message. But we have already looked at the, the meaning of the word old. But the next thing that you can see over here is that the Bible tells us that these are paths. right? These are the ways 
which you can stand in. Now, we are going to talk about the idea of standing in the next message. What does it mean to stand in the old paths? But here, we also see the, how meaningful this is. These are paths that you can stand upon. These are ways that you can walk upon, that you can tread upon. The paths tells us that these paths are firm. This is the foundation and the authority of the old paths. So the first thing that we have seen is that the, the old paths that we need to recognize is that it's the old paths, meaning it has been established, it is perpetual, it is lasting, it has always been there, it is never outdated. But the second thing we recognize is that these old paths are paths that we can walk in. These are paths that are firm. These are paths that is safe for us to walk in. It's not paths, these are not paths that are muddy. These are not paths where the road is unclear. Because the Lord tells us, stand in these old paths. These are not paths where we are unsure about, we are uncertain about. But these are paths that we know. And here it is very important because it tells us that we have a foundation. And together with this foundation, we also have a firm authority. You know, when the Lord said to them, walk in the old paths, and they know what these old paths are, they have an authority, they have a foundation for their lives. They are not left to wander blindly or to try to figure out with uncertainty what is the path, where is the way that God wants them to walk in. And that's why the Lord tells them, you stay, you remain, you stand in the old paths. This is your firm foundation. I cannot tell you to stand on a path unless I know that it is dependable, unless I know that it's reliable. I cannot tell you to walk in this path unless I know that this path is very reliable, that it will certainly lead to life. I will not tell you to walk in it. You know, if let's say I do not know the direction, if I blindly try to direct you here and there, I may lead you astray. But with these old paths, when you instruct, when the Lord instructs His people, walk in these old paths, you will not be led astray. And that speaks of the foundation, the certainty, and the authority that we have. And again, as we have defined, what are these old paths? It is the Word of God, the will of God, not the traditions of men. But the will of God must always be our authority. And that is actually the very, very troubling and worrying thing today. Because as we talk about how people search out for that which is new, one example I cited earlier was the philosophies of the time. Right? What are the things that people want to look for to give them that assurance and that certainty? The dangerous thing is that even professing Christians they look for signs, for example, right? They look at the evidence. Okay? They look at scientific studies. They look at evidence. And to them, they feel that this would give them that certainty. What, what is your, your authority in life? You know, your authority in life cannot be just merely you know, the, the examples of another person, the testimonies of men the signs or the evidence that people cite. Your foundation, your certainty in life must be the old paths. And what are the old paths? It's the Word of God. What God has said, what God has revealed, what God has declared. This is your certainty, your foundation, your promise, your assurance, your confidence in life. One example that really highlights this that shows us how the Word of God must be really the source of our authority, the source of our confidence that we can stand upon, is the doctrine of VPP that you know, we have heard about, that a battle was fought about. Because the question with regard to the preservation of the Word of God, how do we know the Word of God is preserved? It's because the Bible itself tells us that the Word of God is preserved. 
That is our confidence. Whereas those who try to disprove preservation, they would try to use history, archaeology. You see, the thing about history and archaeology is that no one has full knowledge of everything in history. No one is able to make all the observations, all the studying, all the findings in history. And so what is your confidence? Now, by way of illustration, I remember, one way to illustrate this quite clearly is, I remember when we went to Israel several years ago. And when we came to this city, Caesarea by the sea, also known as Caesarea Maritima, that's Caesarea by the sea, our guide actually tried to explain to us that this city is very important for various reasons. But one reason why it's important is because he said, do you know that in the Bible, we have this person known as Pontius Pilate? But there is actually no Roman record in any of the Roman history books or any Roman record. There's no mention or record at all of this person known as Pontius Pilate. And so the guy actually explained to us, he said that for a long time, people have actually wondered whether this person Pontius Pilate was really somebody who actually existed. Right? Was there really someone known as Pontius Pilate? And so he went on to explain that in this city in Caesarea, why it was so important is because archaeologists recently discovered a stone where the city was dedicated to this man known as Pontus Pilate. And so the guide actually told us, he says that this stone proves the Bible true. And I remember immediately after that, after the guide said that, Dr. Ku at the time who was leading that trip, he went up and he said, you know, he would like to correct this statement. He says that the stone does not prove the Bible true. The Bible proves this stone true because without the Bible, the stone has no meaning. Now, in other words, what Dr. Ku is trying to say was that the stone is irrelevant to our faith. Whether there is a stone or not, we know that Pontius Pilate existed because simply the Bible says so. We do not need archaeology. We do not need the Roman history books to confirm our faith. And that's the thing that we need to remember. Our authority is the Word of God itself. It's not examples or all these scientific things that somehow confirms or add to our faith. Our faith is based upon the Word of God and the Word of God alone. It's confirmed by the Word of God. We are certain in the Word of God. We do not need these additional things to confirm our faith. But you know that this is really the approach of the world and not only the world, of many Christians today. The approach to try to use new paths. And the new paths can be like examples. The new paths can be like statistics. The new paths can be archaeology or science. In the way that they would approach the Bible and they would say that with new scientific findings, if it contradicts the Bible, then we have to rethink and relook at the Bible. And that was why recently there's this theologian, right, and, and it stirred the Christian world. Because this theologian, William Lane Craig, quite recently, he suddenly said with regard to the book of Genesis, that he believes that the book of Genesis, at least the first few chapters, is to be read in or understood as what he calls mytho-historical. Mytho-historical simply means it's a historical myth. Right? Historical myth simply means that it's a myth that is based on history. So there are some historical facts to it, but it's still a myth. And the reason why he says is that because of new findings, right? So new findings concerning things like geology. So he says that the, the research in geology shows that there cannot be a universal flood. Therefore, it's not a universal flood. And he even would comment and say things like, no adult would believe in a talking snake. That's his view. They would use signs to try to reinterpret this. Now, if you apply this in a more practical way, you, you would see that many of this charismatic preaching or even new evangelical books, one of the approaches that they like to use is they will use a lot of examples and testimonies 
to establish a doctrine. They would use examples and testimonies as the basis of their doctrine. And that's where I remember, you know, uh, some in the, there was a time where this book was actually quite popular. You know, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Right? That was written by a, a, he's no longer a Christian because he actually renounced the faith. And even told people not to read the book. But at that time, he was a professing Christian. Right? He actually wrote this book about dating. And if you read that book, so people have asked, you know, what should we make of such books? But if you read the books, you realize that what they would do is they would cite a lot of examples. They would cite their own life testimonies. And they say, this happened to me. I did this and then this happened. Therefore, now this is also what you're supposed to do. But why is the authority? Your, the authority is not your life. The authority is not my life. The authority is not your words. It cannot be your words. I cannot tell you, stand on my path. My path, the life that I've walked, the life that I've lived, this is my example. Stand in my path. I cannot tell you to do that. I, the Bible says, stand in the old paths. Now, if I am walking in the old paths, then we can say like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. But you do not follow me because this is simply my experience. Our experiences are very meaningful. Don't get me wrong. But our experiences are very meaningful because they are testimonies of the truth of God. But my testimonies do not prove the truth of God. For example, if I testify of the goodness of God, my testimony does not prove the goodness of God. But my testimony is because of the goodness of God. And there's a big difference. And that's why we need to understand our testimonies, our examples, very properly walk in the old paths. And that's the reason why I referred us to Deuteronomy chapter 6, you know, where the Bible tells us, these are the commandments of God. These are the judgments of God. These are the statutes of God. That in obeying of it, you would fear God. You know, it's very meaningful to actually study each of these words in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Right? What is the meaning of the word commandment? What is the meaning of the word statutes? What is the meaning of the word judgments? Why does the Bible use the different descriptions to describe the word of God? You know, when the Bible describes the word of God as the commandments, it describes the authority of God's word. God's word is not an opinion. You know, God did not say to us, and that's where preachers, we have to be very careful. We don't say, please, would you obey God? Please, would you listen and hearken to the will of God? It's a commandment. God has commanded. The laws of God are to be kept and they are to be obeyed. They are not presented as options or opinions or preferences. God's people cannot pick and choose which they would like to obey and which they would want to forsake. They are commandments. And then the Bible also says statutes. Now, the word statutes comes from the word appointed. So it describes an appointment of time. It describes an appointment of people. It describes the specific tasks or duties that are to be observed. God's appointment. The word judgments tells us that God's word is right. And that's the certainty and the confidence that we have. Now, this may refer to the legal aspect of God's word. You know, where when there's a case, a legal case in the in the children of, in the life of the children of Israel. God's word is always true. God's word is always right. But this tells us one very important nature about this old past, the word of God. It's always good. It's always right. It's always fair. That when you keep it, you obey it, it will always be good for you. And that's what the Bible says. When you obey and keep it, in verse 2, thy days may be prolonged. There's always a blessing in the obedience of God's word because your place in the land, right, for the children of Israel, your land, your security in the land would be preserved and protected. This is the nature of God's word. And that brings us to the third point. Our time is almost up and we have to go very quickly. But it tells us that the old paths are the good paths. And that's what you also see in Jeremiah chapter 6. Verse 16, the Bible says, Ask for the old paths where is the good way. The old paths are good. 
And this is what we must remember and realize about the commandments of God, the judgments of God, the statutes of God, the words of God, is that it's always good. It's always righteous. It's always fair. It's always just. It is good. And the Lord has given to us these commandments for our good and out of His love. It is not subjective. It's not relative. And again, that's the worrying thing. There are some people who make the old paths, you know, the Word of God, as if it's something that is subjective. You know, and sometimes that's where you hear people may make comments like this. They say, that, oh, I, I know that the Word of God is objective. It is true. But there are always these grey areas. There are some things that are neutral. There are some things that are subjective. But the Word of God is not subjective. I understand what people sometimes may be saying, but really at times the reason why they, it may be subjective to them is because they make it subjective because they are unwilling to obey it. But the words of God, they are good. And when you obey it, it will always be for the blessing and for the good of God's people. You know, one way to also illustrate why this is good it's because when God gives us His commandments, do you know it's given out of love? If God did not give us His commandments or tell us what He expects or requires of us, do you know it can be so frustrating? Some people may say that, you know, I'd rather not know. But if you're ignorant of it, you can imagine how frustrating it is. You can just imagine in a relationship with a person. Right? If in the home, in the family, with your spouse, you have some expectations of that person and the person does not meet up to your expectations. And you do not say, you do not say, I would like you to do this. Or parents to children, you do not tell your children, obey me in this. This is the command. This is the instruction. And your, children, your child does not know. Then somehow your child does not meet what you require. Your, your child disobeys you. But the child does not disobey you knowingly. And then you're unhappy. And then now the child comes up to you and say, why are you unhappy? Why are you displeased? What did I do wrong? No, then you did, not, you did not explain anything. You just say, nothing. Oh, nothing. But you show that you're unhappy. You can imagine how difficult it is in this kind of relationship. You know, it's just like also in school. If let's say every semester, I have certain requirements for the course, I have certain expectations. I want you to do the assignments and submit the assignments. If you don't submit, you will not get the grades. But I don't tell you what those assignments are. Then you would say, how are you going to fulfill the requirements for that semester? I say, then if I tell you, I don't care. I want you to fulfill the assignments, but I don't tell you the assignments. Then you say, how am I going to know what the assignments are? And that's why it's only fair. I tell you what the assignments are, what are the requirements, how many pages, when are you supposed to fulfill it? And if you don't fulfill it, then there would be consequences for the not fulfilling of it. But when the instructions, the commandments are given clearly, do you realize that it's actually very good? Because now we know what would delight the Lord, what would glorify Him. We are not left to guess. We are not left to figure out what is the direction that you want me to go, Lord. What is the path? The path is very clear. It's the path that are good for us. The word of God, the will of God, the covenants of God, the promises of God. But the question is whether you will walk in it. There are many, many new paths that people have invented, created, that they want to try to lead you to walk in. But would you walk? In the old paths. You can walk in the old paths when you first recognize what are these old paths. The old paths are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, the will of God that God has given to us. Recognize it. It is old. It means that it is always relevant. It's always good. It is firm. You can walk in it. It's not muddy. You will not sleep. You will not fall. You walk in it. It's firm. You can stand. 
and it is good. Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from